I'm Tracy Sable. Tonight on EWTN News Nightly, a new phase. The hush money trial of former President Donald Trump is now in the hands of the jury. We have the latest trip to Taiwan. U.S. lawmakers visit the island in East Asia. How China is responding. Praying for peace. What Catholic priests in Mexico are saying ahead of crucial elections this weekend. And turning chaos into the cosmos. Pope Francis says the Holy Spirit played a role in the creation of the universe and is available to each of us as well. These stories and more tonight. From EWTN, the Global Catholic Network, this is EWTN News Nightly. Thank you for being with us on the feast of Pope St. Paul VI. Our top story tonight, the fate of Donald Trump is in the hands of a jury. Deliberations in the former president's criminal trial are now underway. The jurors received instructions from the judge this morning, a judge who Trump today called very conflicted and corrupt. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. Owen? Tracy, as former President Donald Trump waits to see what the jury will decide, his rival for the White House hits the campaign trail. President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris flew to Pennsylvania today, the battleground state there, as they try to persuade black voters to support them in November. Election Day now just over five months away. As President Joe Biden left the White House heading for Marine One and taking no questions, his main opponent for the Oval Office, former President Donald Trump, now waiting to see what the historic deliberations in his hush money trial will reveal. In Manhattan at the courthouse, he invoked a well-known Catholic saint. Mother Teresa could not beat these charges. These charges are rigged. The whole thing is rigged. The whole country is a mess between the borders and fake elections. Prosecutors say Trump falsified business records to cover up hush money payments tied to an alleged scheme to bury stories that might have torpedoed his 2016 White House bid. He has denied any wrongdoing and pleaded not guilty to all 34 felony counts. But we'll see. We'll see how we do. It's a very disgraceful situation. Every single legal scholar and expert said this is no case. As Trump fights for his future, President Biden fighting for the black vote. He and Vice President Kamala Harris launching a new summer-long black voter outreach effort with a visit to Girard College in Philadelphia. And then Trump tells you he's the greatest president. I love this one. He says he's the greatest president for black people in the history of America, including more than Abraham Lincoln. The push comes as Biden has seen his solid support among black voters show signs of erosion. An AP Nork poll published in March showed Biden's approval had dropped among black adults from 94 percent when he started his term to 55 percent. With your vote in 2024, we're going to make Donald Trump a loser again. Now, President Biden's son also goes on trial Monday in Delaware. Hunter Biden accused of lying on a federal gun purchase form when he claimed he was not using drugs. And just as that case begins, President Biden is set to travel to France for D-Day commemorations. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. All right, now to the conflict in the Middle East, where Israel's national security advisor is dismissing the idea of a quick end to the war. Sachi Hanegbe said that he expects to see Israel's military operations in Gaza to continue through at least the end of the year in order to destroy Hamas. Aid agencies say the fighting has pushed medical and humanitarian aid to a breaking point. The UN Special Coordinator for the Middle East Peace Process offered a grim assessment of the situation. Palestinians in Gaza face another round of mass displacement, with one million fleeing from Rafah, many being displaced multiple times. Overcrowded conditions and acute shortage of food, water and medicine have led to misery and spread of diseases. The humanitarian response is hopefully inadequate to address these needs. All right now, U.S. aid deliveries to Gaza by sea are suspended. The satellite image right here shows the floating pier system almost completely dismantled. Rough seas broke off a section of it on Sunday. Well, analysis for a number of news agencies shows the weapons used in the deadly airstrike on Rafah, which killed dozens of civilians on Sunday, 
were made in the United States. According to the Hamas run Gaza Health Ministry, at least 45 people were killed and around 200 others wounded when a small diameter bomb struck a camp for displaced people. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu called it a tragic mishap. Israel's military says the airstrike was intended for senior Hamas commanders and that it was not powerful enough to have caused the magnitude of destruction. For more analysis on this developing story, we bring in Chris Cobb-Smith, a former British artillery officer and U.N. weapons inspector and investigator for Amnesty International. Chris, wonderful to be with you today. We appreciate your time. Um, so how do we know that the weapons that were used in this strike were U.S. made? And can you walk us through that identification process? Yeah, well, certainly. I mean, really, all the hard work's been done by other people on online. All I've done is review all the open source information out there. But I have had, managed to look at an awful lot of footage and a lot of photographs of the remnants of the weapon system we're talking about now. And, if, and there's certain elements or certain fragments of that weapon system that, which are quite easily identifiable. You know, we know it's a relatively, a relatively small bomb. Um, and, and by comparing the fragments that we can see in the various images from the scene to the types of weapon systems we, we know are being employed out there. It's fairly easy from the bits that are left to identify exactly what it is. Chris, do we happen to know, um, you know, is this from an old stockpile that the United States has supplied to Israel before or maybe from a new weapon shipment? That we really can't tell. That would take, you know, careful analysis of things like serial numbers, cage numbers and all the various other um writings and, and plates that you might that may be recoverable from the weapon system. Uh, IDF spokesman Daniel Hagari had said the weapons couldn't have caused the fire alone. Um, that being said, I mean, is there an alternative explanation to how this tragedy unfolded and how could it possibly happen? Well, I would agree with that. that these types of weapons don't normally create fires. Um, you know, the, the Hollywood version of detonation of big balls of flame is very, very unusual on the ground. I think what's happened here, and I'm 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 purely supposing, uh, is that the, the fire was caused by a secondary effect. Maybe it hit fuel canisters, uh, cooking uh, cooking gas canisters, or something like that. We've got to remember in that in this densely populated area, in conditions in which people are living, there's likely to be a lot of flammable flammable material around, which could easily have caught a light if there was fuel, or as I said, gas canisters around. Well, Chris, I mean, you've been doing this for a long time. You're an expert on this. People may ask, you know, how does something like this happen with a precision weapon? But we also know, I mean, this has happened with other countries, the United States as well. Uh, back in 2021, there was a drone strike in Afghanistan that mistakenly uh, killed a man and some of his family members. So if these weapons are so precise, how do these things happen? Mistakes happen in warfare almost invariably, it's a hugely confused situation. But what concerns me are the sh is the sheer number of mistakes that we are seeing occurring in this particular scenario, this particular theater of war. Almost from the start of the conflict six months ago, we're seeing, we, we are experiencing strikes on non-combatants, on civilians. And in my view, it's happening far too often. Well, Chris, thank you for taking the time to speak with us. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. Our tensions continue to rise near the Taiwan Strait between China and Taiwan. This week, a U.S. congressional delegation met with Taiwan's new leader in a show of support. It comes days after China held military drills around the self-governing island. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales joins us now in the studio with more. Eric. Well, thank you so much, Tracy. And despite warnings from China, about a dozen U.S. lawmakers visited Taiwan and met with its new president just a week after he took office. House Foreign Affairs Committee Chair Michael McCall, who is leading the trip, said... It's important to show support for the Democratic ally, especially in the wake of the ongoing threats from communist China. All democracies must stand together against aggression and tyranny, whether it's Putin in Russia, the Ayatollah in Iran, or Chairman Xi next door to us in China. An unholy alliance is eroding peace around the world. China sanctioned the Texas Republican after he visited Taiwan last April.
And Chinese TV released video of its military performing live ammunition drills near Taiwan. And Taiwan answered back with maneuvers of its own. The CCP typically views U.S. lawmakers' visits as a threat. Congressman Andy Barr, who co-chairs the Congressional Taiwan Caucus, added. Uh, there should be no doubt. There should be no skepticism in the United States, Taiwan, or anywhere in the world of American resolve to maintain the status quo and peace in the Taiwan Strait. Just last month, Congress approved $2 billion in aid to the Taiwanese military, part of a large foreign aid package that also included money for Israel and Ukraine. Michael Cunningham, a China expert at the Heritage Foundation, says the CCP poses a grave threat to Taiwan. It's real and very serious, um, and that threat has actually been around for quite some time and will remain. So as you know, China views uh, Taiwan as as a core part of its territory. Senator Chris Coons is also in Taiwan with the Senate delegation. He warns of the risk of escalation if the U.S. and its allies don't show deterrence. Uh, if we show determination, uh, if we show that other countries in this region that are democracies are also determined to support Ukraine and support Taiwan, uh, I think we have a, a solid chance of deflecting the possibility of open aggression by the PRC. Michael McCall with the Heritage Foundation adds that if Taiwan's new president ever declares a declaration of independence from China, the CCP would likely consider that a threat of war and would likely respond with arms. And it was just last week that a group of anti-CCP activists were here in Washington, D.C., and held a discussion with U.S. lawmakers urging them to close China's embassy in the district. China's leaders dismissed it. And the conflict, meanwhile, continues. Tracy? All right. Thank you so much, Eric, for that report. Well, a new controversial reform package has led to brawls inside of Taiwan's parliament. <laughs> The opposition-controlled legislature passed changes that are seen as favoring China and diminishing the powers of the island's president. Lawmakers yelled at each other, had shoving matches, and even threw bags of garbage. As that was happening inside the parliament, thousands of the president's supporters gathered outside the legislature to protest the changes. On the street, protesters listened to speeches and chanted slogans, including no democracy without deliberation. It remains unclear whether the package of bills will become law. Well, China is defending new rules which could detain so-called foreigners who are on ships in the South China Sea. Beijing's foreign minister says the measure is in line with international practices. Others are expressing concern. The president of the Philippines says the regulations are, quote, worrisome. This comes amid heightened tensions between the two nations in the South China Sea. Our polls in South Africa are now closed. Millions voted in what is expected to be the most pivotal general election since the end of apartheid. The ruling African National Congress Party could lose its majority for the first time since 1994. That's when Nelson Mandela became the country's first democratically elected president. The party is under fire for widespread corruption and high levels of unemployment. Well, ahead of a crucial election this weekend in Mexico, the faithful and clergy are among those hoping the votes bring relief from ongoing gang violence. This service honored murdered Jesuit priests who allegedly were killed by the drug cartels. The Mexican Bishops' Conference has repeatedly called for peace amid a spike in gang violence. The leading candidate for president met with the bishops. Claudia Scheinbaum says that their view of the violence is, quote, pessimistic. However, she signed an agreement aimed at reducing violence if she is elected. And we have a lot more still to come here on EWTN News Nightly, including The Perilous Fight. Dr. Ben Carson tells us about his new book, which describes what he says is a war on families. is underway in Indiana as part of Planned Parenthood's attempt to expand abortion access. The state has near total ban in place. Currently, abortion is allowed only in rare circumstances and only at a hospital. Abortion activists want it to be more widely available. The trial is scheduled to last through Friday. Well, a new book takes a look at the decline of faith in the United States and how that has led to a decline in society 
and the family unit. The perilous fight overcoming our culture's war on the fa American family by Dr. Ben Carson is an urgent message of concern, hope, and a call to action to help bring the country back to its foundational roots. And joining us now is Dr. Ben Carson, a world-renowned pediatric neurosurgeon, former Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, founder and chairman of the American Cornerstone Institute, and a best-selling author. Dr. Carson, great to be with you today. Um, you Thank have, you. You have written well over a dozen books through the, through the years, but why this topic and why do you think it's so important? because the United States of America is in steep decline. You know, we are a country that went from a ragtag bunch of militiamen to the pinnacle of the world in record time. Why did that happen? It wasn't a coincidence. It was because of the values that we had. And what is the foundation of those values? The cornerstone of everything is the family. And yet family formation is greatly lagging now. And People are getting their values from things like the internet, uh, TikTok, and we only have 23.1 million traditional nuclear families left. People are not getting married. Marriages are dissolving very quickly and very easily. And when you think about it, if there's an outside force that wants to get rid of us, they can't do it militarily. But Marxists can do it by affecting the fabric of our country, dividing us and removing the values that made us into a great nation. So I want people to recognize, first of all, that we are in a war. This is, this is not just a, a normal Sunday afternoon. We are in a fight for who we are as a nation. And we're going downhill very rapidly. We must understand who the enemy is and how to fight them. And Dr. Carson, you know, when did we start to see this shift uh, from the traditional family unit or less emphasis on it? And how has that change impacted our society? Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, a lot of people think this is of recent origin. But if you go back to the congressional record, January the 10th, 1963, and I detailed this in the book, Congressman Herlong of Florida wrote in the 45 goals of communism in America. There were things like gaining control of the school systems so that you can indoctrinate the kids, the teacher unions, the universities, the uh, news media, Hollywood, making sexual perversion normal, natural, and healthy, driving wedges between parents and their children. The list goes on and on. All the things that are happening. It's the very reason that Eisenhower was told by Khrushchev over 60 years ago, your grandchildren's children will live under our system and we won't have to fight a war. That war is being won by forces that want to change us fundamentally into something else. And unless we recognize it and deal with it, they're going to win. Dr. Carson, we're almost out of time, and so much more we can talk about, but I know people can read that in the book. What do you hope people take away from your new book, and where can people get a copy? Anywhere that books are sold, as well as online. And I want people to stop listening to those people who say, you can talk about anything except politics and religion. Those are the very things we need to be talking about because the left wants to change us and they do their best work in the dark. We need to shine the light on what they're doing and we need to combat it effectively. Now, Dr. Ben Carson, thank you so much for your time today. We appreciate it. Congratulations on the new book and God bless you. Thank you so much. Up next on EWTN News Nightly, clergy abuse report. What the head of the USCCB is saying about new numbers on the church in the United States. Plus, learn more about a Vatican group dedicated to spreading the gospel around the world. of Fresno, California is filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. The move comes amid more than 150 child abuse claims. The new allegations came to light after California temporarily relaxed the statute of limitations on sex abuse charges. The bishop says bankruptcy will ensure that all victims are compensated fairly. Now, despite the news in Fresno, a new report finds overall the number of abuse claims against Catholic clergy in the U.S. has dropped. According to the report from the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, between the middle of 2022 and the middle of 2023, there were around 1,300 clergy abuse allegations. That number is down 
from 2,704 the previous year. Add in 2019, there were 4,434 allegations of abuse. Uh, Archbishop Timothy Brolio, head of the USCCB, says in part, quote, these numbers are not just numbers. The statistics are the many stories and accounts of the betrayal of trust and the lifelong journey toward recovery. And he added that he is grateful to the survivors for reporting the abuse. Pope Francis is honoring the work of the Pontifical Mission Society as the Holy Father made his remarks during the group's annual General Assembly in Rome. Pope Francis encouraged the missionaries to follow the example of martyrs who have sacrificed their lives for their faith. And he also gave them three main themes on which to focus. Joining us now from Rome is Father Karl Wallner, head of the Austrian section of the Pontifical Mission Society. Father, thank you for your time today. We appreciate it. Can you tell us more about this audience with the Pope and what he had to say to you? We are a global network to help the Pope to promote the mission. And every year we have the General Assembly. And this year it started with the audience with the Holy Father. And it was rather programmatic because Pope Francis gave us three themes that are very important for the future of the Pontifical Mission Societies. He wanted us to build up a global network, communio. He wanted us to have creativity. This for me was very interesting because in Austria we had a lot of new ideas ideas and they are working. We have to promote the missions at the level of the 21st century with the medias of nowadays and so on. And the second point, I had to look what means the word tenacity. Yeah, it was not, I, I'm an Austrian, I'm not used to this English word. Uh, <laughs> tenacity is to be stubborn, yeah? So not, not to be afraid, to, uh, to, to just to continue, because we have a lot of obstacles. So he said we have to build up a communion worldwide. We have to be creative and find new, new means also for fundraising. And the third thing was uh, do not be... This in, this courage. Have courage, yeah. Try again, try hard, yeah, because nothing is lost with the help of the grace. Yeah, and Father Curious, what topics um, were discussed during this General Assembly? The General Assembly is for me always very touching. We are together for eight days and we are 120 national directors. So in every country where the church is free to work, there is a national director. He is nominated by the Holy See and we are the pontifical mission societies, not the Episcopal mission societies. So we work on behalf of the Holy Father, pontifical, for the bishops, because they are responsible for the mission. But of course, a single bishop or a diocese, they are very focused on their own problems. So we are to help the dioceses, to help the bishops, to keep the heart open for the worldwide church, for the mission. And Father, before I let you go, um, are there any special projects that you're currently working on? Well, in Austria, we are a small country. Look, we have 9 million inhabitants and 4.7 million of them are still Catholic. That number is going down. And we try to promote the importance of mission in our parishes. And we are doing projects because bishops, missionaries, uh, congregations of religious sisters who work in the poorest countries of the world, they ask us to support them. For instance, Madagascar. There will be a focus on Madagascar. I personally have have been there. I've been touched by this poverty, yeah, but also by the courage and by the love of the Salesian sisters who take the, the children out of the street, take them out of the of this waste, uh, I do not know the English word, big, big, big rubbish places everywhere, and people are living there. Little children are living there, and they take them out, they give them education, they bring them into school, and we support this. Well, Father Walner, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Thank you for all that you do. We appreciate your time. God bless you. God bless you, too. Thank you for your work. Thank you very much. Pope Francis reminds the faithful that the Spirit of God, which at the beginning of time transformed chaos into cosmos, exists in every human person. Faccia persone nuove con la novità dello spirito. At his weekly talk at the Vatican, the Holy Father says that the external chaos that we see in the world can only be healed if we begin to heal the internal chaos within our hearts. He added that we will never lose hope if we keep our focus 
on Jesus. And finally tonight, speaking of God's creation, a number of the beauty, a reminder of the beauty that is, and power of the earth is taking place right now in Iceland. A volcano in the southwestern part of the European country is erupting, sending red streams of lava around 160 feet into the air. A small coastal town had mostly been evacuated months ago when the volcano came to life after being dormant for centuries. And we thank you for watching tonight. And remember, you can follow us on social media, Facebook X and Instagram at EWTN News Nightly. I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.